So ever since we made that video on core memory with uh, Carl's IBM uh, Ferrite uh, core memory plane, I wanted to have my own and you know, display them properly. Uh, so I bought some from there. It turns out there's uh, some that are available on eBay for quite a reasonable price from, uh, from Russia. Because Russia use core memory far uh, longer than uh, we did here in the West. And uh, I found two of them and I, I put them in this magnificent plexiglass breakout board. Um, so I just you know, took some plexiglass, I think that's from a container store, and then uh, you know, added some banana plugs around. I'll show you how they're connected and put a little protector so you don't uh, hold, you, know, you, you, don't, you protect the, the back of the array and don't break it. So I have two planes. One is a four kilobits bit uh, that was probably part of a four kilo word array with many of those stacked one for each bit. And I have a smaller one, it's uh, one kilobits. If you have not already done so, I recommend you watch first the core memory explanation video, but I'll give you a quick redux here to bring you up to speed. The scheme that became the main computer memory technology from the 1950s all the way to the mid-1970s was invented by Jay Forrester at MIT and first demonstrated in the Whirlwind computer in 1955. In fact, here is an original Whirlwind core plane and the actual Whirlwind core memory stack now at the Computer History Museum. In core memory, the bits are held by the magnetization state of tiny ferrite cores. These can be magnetized in two orientations, clockwise or counterclockwise. You magnetize them by running currents through wires that go through them. Addressing wires are in a regular XY matrix. The combined current through the wires has to be higher than the threshold value for a core to flip its magnetization, a property that's used to address a single core in the matrix. There is also a global sense wire used for reading and a global inhibit wire for writing. Note that sensing signals are only generated when a core flips, so reading a bit consists in setting a core to zero and see if it causes a sense signal indicating a flip. By the same token, this erases the bit. Therefore, reading is destructive and every bit that is sensed has to be rewritten immediately afterwards. So the idea is that they both look pretty and presentable and now you can hand them to people so, and they are protected on both sides by plexiglass. But it's also functional so that it's actually a breakout with uh, banana plugs to a few X and Y wires and I also have the sense and inhibit so we can actually flip some cores. And to make them work we are going to use our two HP pulsers and that's uh, the main reason why I bought um, the extra HP8082 pulser and repaired it in the previous videos. So the first thing I had to do is figure out what the weave pattern was used. In this one, there are four sub pattern, four sub array of 1K each. And the X and Y uh, pattern runs uh, pretty much through all the four sub arrays. And I had to figure out what the inhibit and sense wire do. And the inhibit is pretty straightforward, snakes around. There's first one wire that I put in red that goes through half of the core. And then there's a little splice at the end, which you can see, and then it comes to the blue wire and comes back here. It turns out there are two sense wire. There's sense A and sense B. And sense A, uh, if you follow the wire, and you can see that it, it calls out half of the array, then goes in the opposite quadrant, and then it comes back and covers the rest of the array. So uh, sense A uh, does two subarray, and sense B is not a wire that does the two other subarrays. So the way I wired this one, I, put, I picked two X and Y lines that are in this qu uh, quadrant over here. So I can read them with sense A. Uh, I, I, I nevertheless have sense B over here, I also have inhibit. So two Y and two X, so we can flip four bits in that giant uh, 1K memory. The second array is uh, more traditional, it's just one, one big array here. And uh, on this one, it's kind of weird. You have one sense wire that does uh, three quarters of the array, 
uh, it starts over here, that's the red one and comes out over here. And you have another one, the blue one, that only does a quarter of the array. And I'm not too sure why they did that, uh, but anyhow, what I ended up doing is completing the turn here and having those shorted, so I have one wire that does uh, all the uh, sensing in the array. Same thing, I had uh, two X wire, uh, less space in that one, so I have just one Y wire, the inhibits over here, and here's the sense that I've put in one single loop. So the first thing I need to figure out is the current at which the cores flip uh, magnetic polarity. And for that, I'm going to use two short pulses of opposite polarities using my two pulsers. So the first one is going to come from the bottom one, and, and that's, we use the magic button to make the edges not too steep, so we reduce the amount of um, picked up noise from anything else that's not a, co a fast core flip. And then I'm going to trigger the second generator of the first one. If I do this right, yeah. And uh, get my second pulse. So there's two things I want to do to this pulse. I want first to have it in the other polarity, so that's easy, turn it to negative. And then uh, I need to delay it so it arrives after the first one. And that's the magic delay that I repaired in the previous video. Uh, and there you go, so that's, now you guys understand why I wanted that delay to work so badly. So that's going to be one set pulse and one reset pulse and uh, we are going to figure out how to combine them and how to make a current driver out of it. So I want the two pulses on the same wire and for that I need a little combiner circuit which I made quickly right here and all that does is I have the pulse coming from the two generators and I have two 25 ohm resistors, so as far as the generator sees it, it's just terminated by 50 ohm, which is what it should be. And uh, when this one pulls up, the signal comes you know, through the diode from the ground, through the 50 ohm resistor. When this one pulls down, uh, it comes through that diode and through the two resistors, and here I should get a bipolar pulse combined with half the amplitude. And that's this magnificent circuit over here, which we are going to hook up. And... Uh, trigger. There we go. And here we have our two pulses. I need a little bit of adjustment. There we go. So next up I need to amplify the pulse uh, because I expect the flipping to happen at a current anywhere from 500 milliamps to in amp. And for that I'm going to continue piling on the HP equipment and use this baby here, the 6824 DC power supply amplifier. And what this is, is a bidirectional uh, power supply, you can use it as such, and you can you know, have it go from minus 60 volt to plus 60 volts. But you can also put it in the amplifier mode, and in that mode, it basically tries to match the power, uh, the, the voltage at the output of the power supply to the input that you give it. And it's mediumly fast, I think it goes to a few tens of kilohertz, so that should be perfect for our use. And on the output, I have a 10 ohm resistor, so I get one volt for every 100 milliamps, so I can easily test it. And if I turn the gain on, here's my directional output. And I actually calibrated my probe, so it, uh, it reads directly in milliamps, there's a little setting on the scope that allows you to set the probe to read milliamps. In my case it's 10 volt per amp. As you can see it in the corner. So I'm already at half an amp. And if I push it, I'm going to go to one amp. And since it's pulse and it's mostly idling, the um, core memory won't get hot at all. So now the output pulse goes through the resistor so I can measure it, then back through one line. And uh, to see what we are doing, I am going to monitor the inhibit line. 
and what that guy is going to do is that you no, know, we are going one of these lines I'm going to flip them all at the same time and then the inhibit line should pick it all up so I'll have many many cores flipping at the same time so I should have a fairly strong signal off we go all right so nothing goes all right 800 milliamps 200 milliamps uh, to fix oh there it goes there you have it so you see the course flipping and that's at 380 milliamps so about about 400 milliamps okay so our cores are flipping about, about 400 milliamps all right now that we have a good idea of what our current should be we can go and build our little current driver here's the Skookum version uh, no current driver relies always on the same principle somewhere you put a resistor to uh, sense the current and then you have some feedback loop that um, ties on that so here let's imagine we want 500 milliamp be driven through the load through the transistor and we put a 10 ohm so it will have 5 volts over here and if the transistor is driven by an op amp and you put 5 volts at um, the input it will try to get this point also at 5 volts um, to balance everything. Uh, so this one will guarantee you a, a 100 milliamp per volt input perfectly. Uh, and if you want to do it the simpler non skookum way, uh, you can do it just this way with a bipolar transistor, where you know, the same sensing resistor is here, and basically this point will adjust at 0.6 volts the drop of the base emitter junction above. So if I, point, if I put 5.6 volts over here, I'll have 500 milliamps. The final version is actually a little bit more complicated. Uh, so I have a resistor to match it to basically 50 ohm impedance, a little bit more, but approximately. And I have a switch so I can easily invert the polarity of the signal so I can set and reset the cores. Easy circuit to prototype, there it is. And then when I make sure it works, I like to build permanent version. So the Adafruit has these things that look like breadboard and you can actually solder it. And I make my little circuit that will fit on this smaller board. And once I've you know, put all the components at the right place, I just need to build them. So it's pretty simple. So let's just go wire this up. Okay, so I'm all hooked up with the Y uh, driver, the X driver, and uh, I am actually measuring the pulse straight of the current sensing resistor. So I am uh, actually calibrated directly in milliamps. If I get that guy up, there it is. Ah, it won't quite go there the whole way. I need to get the next range here. 300 milliamp on the X and 300 milliamp on the Y. So now we're going to see if we can read something from the cores. And for that, I am going to hook up to sense A, my sense wire. And that's a blue trace, so you, you can see it actually. And what you see are not the cores flipping quite yet. What, what you see is the stray signals picked up from the transition. So I need to slow them down until, there you go, until they are slow enough that they don't induce parasitic currents. And that's where the HP8082 really shows its level. There we go, so now they have disappeared. I am going to go into manual. Alright, manual. Okay, so I give it one pulse at a time manually. So I can now give them pulse manually. So, if all is working fine, I just give, give it a pulse that 
uh, more than it takes to flip a core at the coincidence. So if I reverse polarity, I'm going to flip it in the other direction. So I reverse polarity in the two wires. Give it another pulse. Oh, there we go. And then you see, I, oh, it's pretty right actually. Right somewhere in the middle of the second pulse, it's enough to flip the core. And if I read it a second time, it's gone because it only reads the flux. So the read is destructive in core memory. After you write it, you have to read it again. So now we have flipped it in the other direction. And then if I read it after flipping, oh, something happened. I'm not getting the current I'm supposed to get here. There you go. And um, you see that it went, so it flipped the other direction. So one of my switch didn't switch quite correctly. Let's try it again. So that's one direction. Read again. It's gone. Flip it. And here we see it. Read again. It's gone. So uh, I'm actually quite pleased with this. The uh, This four-wire system is a lot less noisier than the three-wire system that IBM used. It just gives me a really clean signal. Now, if you look at it, it's very small. This is 10 millivolts. So this is like a 15 millivolt spike. So uh, if we want this to be usable, we need to add one more thing to bring it to a logic level. And that one more thing is this little circuit here, which is the uh, sense amplifier that we made when we were working on the AGC. And this is actually made with um, period uh, amplifiers. It's three circuits in one. It's an amplifier. It's a threshold detector. And it's a pulse flapper. It puts all, either whether it's negative or positive, the pulse is always positive at uh, the output. Here it is all wired up. Uh, sense coming now to the amplifier and the output comes to the scope which is now back on, on two volts per division. So we should have now a big fat logic signal. If I pulse it and flip it. There we go. We, we get a nice big uh, pulse here, nice and, f and fat. And then if I reread it, it's gone. But now if I flip it in the other direction, Instead of, of having a negative pulse, as I had before, this one flips it up. So I always have a signal showing in the right direction, no matter what the flip is, if it's uh, up to down or down to up. So now that we have it working kind of beautifully, uh, we can start to reduce our cycle time. I can reduce the pulse width, make them a little steeper, see if it... So now I'm taking advantage of the thresholds. So can... See, yeah, there we go. So flipping. So we have done like three months of research in five minutes, thanks to our good equipment here. Okay, so now we are back into reasonable time frames we are at 500 nanoseconds per division so ooh, actually that's very good i never had core memory work this fast uh, well i cannot go much faster than the core itself so the core takes about 300 nanoseconds so we have a one and a half nanosecond um, uh, time in here that's not bad at all it's very clean flips so now that we are optimized, let's see if we can prove that we can read and set two bits independently. So I'll set the bit on this line and let's set the other bit on this other line. Okay, it was the other polarization. So we reset our two bits. So now I should be able to read that one without destroying the other one. So I read, I read this one and I destroyed it. It's, it's gone. And I go to the other one, which is on the same vertical line, right? But it shouldn't have been destroyed because the currents were not coincident. So 
so I should be able to read it. And there it is. So I have independently set two bits. Read bits separately on the same row thanks to coincidence current addressing. Uh, we should be all good to go. Oh, so this one is, look at that, it's, okay, so I, I see the bit flipping, so we see several things here. This one is way more sensitive to the edge, uh, so I need to go back to an unoptimized setting here, with much bigger pulses, even more, there you go, so I need to go to very slow edges, there you go. So this one will work a lot slower. Interesting. And actually I would have expected the denser one to pick up more of the, the stray uh, signal, but no. This one is more sensitive to stray signals. I don't know why. So that's, that's entirely in the weave. It's not due to the course. Flip it, there it is. Alright, so that's it for uh, playing with core memory and uh, as you can tell it takes a lot to get uh, core memory working so you can imagine what those people went through to make their, their computer working and what a revolution solid state memory was in 1974 where, when Intel introduced it. Right, thanks for watching, see you next time. But before we leave, there's something else that I want to show you that we are lucky to have today. And I wanted to make a video on, but because of the COVID situation, we have not been able to do it. And this is a piece of the LVDC uh, computer memory. So that's the launch vehicle digital computer. That's the computer that was piloting the Saturn V. And uh, we of course got it on loan. Uh, I can't remember the size of this thing, maybe 8K, something like that. I, I need uh, Ken Chef did all the, the reverse engineering, so I'll, I'll make a video when we can get together again.